Stress pretty much affects every single person in the world. All of us have pretty much felt some kind of stress over the last year or at some point in our lives. Natural remedies like a good night's sleep, exercise, you know, walking, yoga, meditation, things like that can all help with stress. But today I wanna look into ashwagandha and see its effects on anxiety and stress. So anxiety is a condition that a lot of people have felt before. Around 20% of Americans have had some form of anxiety in the past year. It's also more prevalent in women than in men around 23% prevalence in women and 14% in men. So anxiety is something that affects a lot of people and we kind of want to find answers so that we can reduce our anxiety levels and stress levels. So ashwagandha is a herb supplement and its active component is called withanolides. And the way that it works is it kind of acts on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, also known as the HPA axis. This is our major response to stress and cortisol levels. So the fact that ashwagandha acts on the HPA axis kind of gives its reasoning as to why it would work for anxiety. So kind of a dumbed down way of what benefits ashwagandha has is that it decreases cortisol levels or kind of the stress levels. Cortisol is our stress response. It increases testosterone, it increases thyroid hormone, and it also increases serotonin signaling. I'm not gonna go too much into the details on the mechanism of how ashwagandha works. Let's just kind of dive deep into some studies and see if it actually works for stress and anxiety. So the first study we're gonna look at is this one here called a perspective randomized double blind placebo controlled study of safety and efficacy of a high concentration full spectrum extract of ashwagandha root in reducing stress and anxiety in adults. That is a unnecessarily long title, holy sh Anyway, in this study we have 64 patients with a history of chronic stress. The dose in this study was 300 milligrams twice daily for 60 days and the treatment group had a significant reduction in scores on all stress assessment scales on day 60 relative to placebo. They also had significantly reduced cortisol levels compared to placebo. Also, no serious adverse effects were reported. So we're off to a good start. We have one study around 60 people that lasted 60 days, and we have proof that ashwagandha reduced cortisol levels, reduced stress and anxiety, and it was safe. Now let's look at another study which has just as ridiculous of a title, Body Weight Management in Adults Under Chronic Stress Through Treatment with Ashwagandha Root Extract, a Double-Blind Randomized Placebo-Controlled Trial. So in this study, we had 52 people under chronic stress take 300 milligrams of ashwagandha twice daily or placebo for eight weeks. So this is a very similar sized and duration study. 60 days for the first study, 56 days for the second study, 54 people in the first study, 52 people in the second study. And the study found that at the four week mark and eight week mark, the treatment group had significant improvements in primary and secondary measures. The primary measures were the perceived stress scale and food cravings, basically a questionnaire. And the secondary measures were the Oxford happiness questionnaire, three factor questionnaire, serum cortisol levels, which is basically your blood cortisol levels or stress, body weight, weight and body mass index. The ones I want to focus on are the questionnaires, the serum cortisol levels and the body weight. So in terms of questionnaires, it's not that reliable because you know, you're kind of asking people how they feel versus getting an objective measure. It's mostly subjective. So it's not very, very reliable in differentiating with the placebo, but nonetheless, the people that took ashwagandha had better scores than those on placebo. So it kind of does show that ashwagandha works in terms of reducing stress, even through the questionnaires, but serum cortisol levels is probably a better indicator. And it was also significant in that sense. And the way we figure out statistical significance is based off of alpha and P values. So basically the P value has to be less than alpha. Alpha is the probability of mistakenly thinking that there's a difference in your study or your treatment group versus your placebo when there is not. So the point of any study basically is to either show that these two things are the same or that or they're not the same, right? So depending on a study, either you want to show a difference or you don't want to show a difference in the treatment group and the placebo group, right? If you want to show that something is not, you know, any worse than some other treatment form, then you want to show that there's no difference. If you want to show that this treatment is better than that treatment or that placebo or whatever, then you want there to be a difference. In this case, we want to prove that ashwagandha is better than placebo, so we want to see a difference. Alpha is set by the researchers and it's usually 0.05, probably 99% of research papers that I have ever read have an alpha set to 0.05, which basically means that we're 95% certain that the results from this study are accurate and not due to chance. So if we get a p-value less than 0.05, that means that our result was statistically significant and not due to chance. If we get a p-value above 0.05, 
that means that our results were probably due to chance or some kind of thing that we didn't account for. So we kind of have to negate the results. Now, how do you get p-value is based off of statistics and there's online calculators that kind of calculate the p-value for you because I'm sure the calculation is very, very confusing. So it's much easier to put, you know, all your results online and then the computer system or calculator or whatever will tell you the results. And then you'll compare that with your alpha and you see if what you have was significant or it was not. So for example, we see that serum cortisol levels at week eight have a p-value of 0.0148 which is less than 0.05, which is the alpha that the researchers in this study set it to. So like I said, 99% of the time, the alpha is 0.05, and there's no difference here. In this study, it's again 0.05. But if we look at blood pressure, we see a p-value of 0.445 at eight weeks. So since 0.445 is greater than 0.05, that means that this result was not statistically significant. The difference was probably due to chance. And depending on how you look at it, that might be a good thing or a bad thing, right? If I had no idea that ashwagandha could reduce blood pressure and I saw in my results that ashwagandha reduced blood pressure, I look at my p-value to see, okay, is this significant or is it not? And if it's not significant, then I kind of know that even though the treatment group had lower blood pressure results, for example, it doesn't matter because the results are probably due to chance. But let's say ashwagandha raised blood pressure and I'm like, oh damn, ashwagandha possibly raises blood pressure. And then I go look at my p-value and I see that it's above 0.05 and I go, all right, thank God. Ashwagandha does not reliably increase blood pressure. That was just, you know, a dumb luck based off of the results. So I could kind of throw that away as well. So depending on what you're looking for or what's going on, you might want the p-value to be significant or not significant. It just kind of depends on, you know, the, the outcome. And with that being said, I want to note that ashwagandha was safe and effective in this trial for the duration of the study. And there's also many other studies that talk about ashwagandha and its improved mood, improved mental and physical performance. However, I'm not going to really go into those studies because they're not really the main point of ashwagandha. The main thing is its ability to reduce anxiety. And also, I believe that its ability to improve mood, improve mental and physical performance is because of its ability to reduce anxiety levels and stress levels. So as a result, you're able to have better mental and physical performance because you're able to focus better uh, because your stress levels are lower. Okay, so now let's go over dosing. There's basically four main types of dosing and we'll go over it here. So the first one is the basic extract, one to two and a half percent with analytes, 500 to 1000 milligram daily. The next one is KSM 66, 5% with analytes, 300 to 900 milligrams daily. Sensoril, 10% with analytes, more sedating than the other dosages, 100 to 500 milligrams daily. Root powder, less than 0.5% with analytes, one to three grams daily. So depending on what form of ashwagandha you get, the dosages are different. However, I would say that KSM 66 is probably the most um, common and most reliable form of ashwagandha. It has the best side effect profile. It's not as sedating as the other ones. Sensoril is the most sedating. So if you're looking for that effect on top of your you know, lowered anxiety levels and a sensoril formulation is probably better. But KSM 66 is good for its effectiveness and its reduced drowsiness if you want to take it during the day. So dosing for ashwagandha is around 300 milligrams twice a day. That's what they used in the studies and you kind of want to cycle off and on ashwagandha either one to two months on and then one to two months off and the reason for this is because we want to reduce tolerance because it's possible that you can get a tolerance due to ashwagandha you can also micro cycle which is basically you take ashwagandha four or five times during the week and you skip the other two or three days the reason why this is also good and effective is because it still protects against tolerance and it also is good because you can kind of take it whenever you need it if you kind of predict that hey on this day or that day or this kind of these these days during the week I'm going to need my ashwagandha versus if you kind of cycle macro cycle once, you know, two months on two months off, then what if you need it at some point in those two months, you know, for a week or something like that, you're kind of stuck, you kind of might, you might build tolerance, things like that. So micro cycling kind of makes more sense, especially if you're more jittery or more like, you know, have random episodes of anxiety versus longer, you know, parts of your life or your stress and things like that. So if you have a longer stress period, you kind of want to take ashwagandha for a longer period of time. But if you have kind of days or moments here and there that you're a little more stressed or something is coming up or things like that, then you can micro cycle and take it for a few days, take it off for a few days and then kind of go based off of it like that. Okay, so now in terms of timing and when to take ashwagandha, there really isn't a best time versus, you know, one versus the other. The timing of when you're gonna take it kind of matters on what your needs are. So there's basically two ways of taking it, right? Two basic ways. There's a single dose and there's a split dose. The split dose was the way that it was done in the studies where it was 300 milligrams or 600 milligrams twice daily, usually 
usually once in the morning and one at night. If you're gonna take it like that, then that's kind of the only way you could take it because it's every 12 hours. But if you're gonna do a single dose, then it matters on what your needs are, right? If you're taking Sensoril for sedation and reducing anxiety, then obviously take it at bedtime so it helps you fall asleep. But if you're taking like KSM 66 and it doesn't make you drowsy and you know you like to go to the gym around one or 2 p.m., then take it you know one hour before going to the gym, something like that, because then you'll get your reduced anxiety and you'll also get the added benefit of the improved mental and physical performance. So in terms of timing, there really isn't a best timing. It just kind of matters on your needs. However, I will say that ashwagandha's half-life is pretty short at two to four hours. So dosing it every 12 hours, you know, twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, is probably more effective than just taking a single dose because the effects are not, probably not gonna last you till the next day. However, if you split the dose and you kind of have a better chance of it mellowing you out throughout the day. And the studies that we looked at had ashwagandha doses at 300 to 600 milligrams twice daily. So even in the studies, they did a split dose so that's kind of what I would do if I was taking ashwagandha. Something else you want to remember is that you want to take ashwagandha with a meal because it's fat soluble. It needs fat to be absorbed. Very similar to the fat soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and K, where those need fat to be absorbed better. That's why they're usually in like a soft gel or something like that because they have oil with it. Same thing with ashwagandha. You kind of want to take it with fat or an oil to better absorb it. I want to quickly mention how ashwagandha supplements build tolerance and why you would want to cycle. So it's kind of three main things that we want to look at. The first way the body builds tolerance tolerance is by increased enzyme production. So the more ashwagandha there is, the more enzymes come into play and these metabolize the ashwagandha and break it down and have it excreted. So that's one way to get tolerance, increased enzyme production, increased breakdown of ashwagandha and it's not able to have its effects. So the second one is receptor withdrawal. The receptors that ashwagandha binds to, they start backing up, making it more and more difficult for the ashwagandha to actually bind to the receptor. This is because there's you know just too much ashwagandha laying around or too often. And so the receptors are kind of backing away. They don't want to bind as much and so you get tolerance that way. And the third one is loss of receptor density. And this is basically a addition to the receptor withdrawal. So the receptors back up so much and for so long, if you continuously take ashwagandha, because since they're not as active as they once were before, the receptor kind of loses functionality because it's withdrawn so much and for so long that it kind of forgets what to do. And then the ashwagandha kind of becomes useless and tolerance is just way, way too much. And you need to be weaning off of it for a long time until you know the receptor comes back out and you can take ashwagandha regularly again. Now, aside side effects, again, like I mentioned previously, ashwagandha is pretty much safe and effective, um, especially at the doses and the duration that we had in those studies, around two months and 300 to 600 milligrams. You can kind of bet that ashwagandha is safe for that time. However, some side effects that you can get are drowsiness and sensation. Like I said, with the sensorol, it's more likely, but it's kind of possible with all of them. And pretty much every medication or supplement that acts on anxiety has the same you know, drowsiness effect. If you've ever taken benzodiazepines like Ativan or Xanax, they have a very high level of drowsiness associated with them. And again, ashwagandha, since it has an effect on cortisol levels and stress levels, it can cause drowsiness, but it kind of matters on each person. But again, the sensorol version is probably the one that causes the most sedation, whereas KSM 66, not as much. And I mentioned a few times to cycle on and off ashwagandha, you know, one month on, two months off or whatever. Something to cycle with is L-theanine. That could be something that you can substitute in instead of ashwagandha and have a video on L-theanine that I'm going to link in the description for you to check out. L-theanine is also really good for reducing stress. So make sure to check that video out as well. But that's it for this one. Please leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the content. Thank you for watching.